Once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have. As the people of God, let us worship him. Let's pray together. Lord, with the same gladness that was present in the hearts of the wise men, we come to you today, uh, likewise bending our knees, likewise acknowledging Jesus as King, likewise bringing all that's most precious to us and laying it at his feet. 
We worship him this morning as the sign of hope, as the light in the darkness, as the one who forgives us and frees us and invites us to live in a new way. Lord, we praise you this morning for the gift of Jesus Christ who came to be the light of the world. And we confess that even though we've seen his light and felt his touch and experienced his love and, and even knelt before his cross, we still hang back, clinging to the shadows, often obscuring rather than reflecting his light. And so we also ask for your forgiveness, Lord, for those times when we've failed to be transparent to your light, when our lives have made it harder rather than easier for other people to see you. We pray that we might be open to the light and capable of showing others the depth and richness and abundance of color of a life that is lived for you. And we ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to begin by sharing a story that came my way some years ago in a prison fellowship newsletter. Like my Christmas tree, it began. The question came through the meal slot of a locked cell door. I was kneeling on the stone hard floor outside of the cell, my arms on the meal slot hatch that always felt vaguely sticky with old food my chin resting on my knuckles, my knees hurt. Framed in the open slot like a living portrait was John's face, or at least as much of his face as the frame let me see. His dark eyes shone with intelligence, but, but always too with something else. Sometimes bewilderment, other times wonder, now quiet sorrow, now quiet rage. He was a sensitive, passionate, thoughtful fellow who had committed a terrible crime. We had shared many quiet conversations through that slot, each of us kneeling and sometimes turning our ear to hear the other when the, the pounding or the screaming in the neighboring cells got too loud. He had swung sideways to give me a better view into his cell, his arms stretched out like uh, a stage performer finishing a song, his open hand gesturing toward the back corner of the cell. And down there where the cell's bare concrete floor met two bare concrete walls, sat a colorful little cardboard Christmas tree about eight inches tall. Yeah, I said, I really like it. And so I did. It was so small and so out of place, but so powerful. Deep in that prison's monotonous darkness, that little tree's irrepressible colors insisted on brightening up the world. That little tree brought us together in a brief moment of shared joy. It was a moment of truth. The reality of 
Jesus' love of God with us broke through the immediacy of isolation and pain in which John was immersed day after day. But that incongruous little tree spoke to me at a deeper level too. It was so out of place, but so right. At that moment, it seemed like the one right thing in a place where everything else felt so wrong. Its very incongruity suddenly anchored me to Christ. And then the prisoner's tiny Christmas tree convicted me. It was brightening its little corner. But what about me? Was I as incongruous in that place, in any place, as that little tree? Or did I blend right in? Was I incongruous, out of place, as Jesus, in his time and place, was incongruous? Did I brighten the corner where I was? John asked me if I liked his Christmas tree. But his question gave me a set of convicting questions that I still ask myself. Brian Inkster, who wrote that, found himself asking some hard and challenging questions about himself and about his life. And today, as we move further into this new year, those are questions that that you and I should be asking ourselves as well. As Christians, are we brightening the little corner of the world in which God has placed us? Am I sensitive to the fact that in the words of the old children's hymn, Jesus bids us shine with a pure, clear light? As his disciple, do I stand out as being somehow different than the world around me? Or, as Brian worried, do I sadly blend right in? Those aren't easy questions to answer. They're not easy questions to face. Most of the time, I think they're questions we'd rather not deal with at all. But do we have any choice? In one of the traditional readings for this season, one I think you heard a couple weeks ago, we're reminded that it was the light of a star that first led the wise men to Jesus. From somewhere in the east, they followed it to Jerusalem, from there to Bethlehem, where they finally found the child of promise they'd been looking for. In the prophecy of Isaiah, the people of Israel are told that there's a day coming when the peoples of the entire earth will be drawn to them because of a light, because of a radiance that will shine in their midst. And then, in the Sermon on the Mount, we're reminded that the light of the star has been replaced by a different light, the light of Jesus Christ shining among and within his people. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. Not I am the light of the world, although Jesus said that too, but you are the light of the world. We are the ones who are called to shine for him. We are the ones that he has entrusted to be his ambassadors. We are the ones whose lives are meant to give the world cause to stop and wonder and glorify God. And that's precisely what Brian was wrestling with in the hallway outside of that prison cell. Am I brightening my little corner? Does my life shine for Christ, or is my lamp even lit? And that's what we need to be wrestling with, too. Because it's hard being different. It's hard to stand out. 
peer pressure isn't only a problem for our young people, it's a problem for all of us. The world we live in is constantly pushing us, pulling us, prodding us to follow its lead, to conform to its mold, to accept its rules, to live by its norms. You take risks when you try to be different, even when you're different in the name of good, because often the world persecutes those who are not its own. But our calling is still to shine like Jesus, like that little Christmas tree. Deep in the monotonous darkness of this world, Jesus calls us to be an irrepressible source of color. In the midst of all the gloom we see around us, not just in the gray clouds of January, but in the midst of this pandemic and amidst the shattered hopes and dreams of the people around us, Jesus calls us to live as a, a ray of hope, as a source of good cheer. In a world where so often everything else seems so wrong, Jesus calls us to live as perhaps the one thing that can point people to something right. And note that Jesus isn't talking about our having to be a floodlight here. He's talking about us being a lamp. A light bulb doesn't have to be a million watts in order to get noticed. Against a background of darkness, even the tiniest light can drive back the shadow and draw the eye. Often it's not so much the power as it is the contrast that makes the difference. And so it's by the work of countless little lights, each illuminating their own small corner of the world, that things are inevitably changed. There's a square in the town of Timisoara, Romania, where once such lights were lit. A square where one night thousands of tiny candles were, were lit in defiance of the darkness. The people of Timisoara, and most notably the people of Timisoara's churches, had gathered to protest the arrest of one of their pastors, a, a man by the name of Laszlo Tokes. And predictably, in the end, those candles were met with force. Troops were given the order to open fire. Hundreds of people were shot. The night was December the 17th, 1989. But by the dawn of Christmas morning, just eight days later, everything had changed. Not only Laszlo Tokes, but all of Romania was free. The darkness had surrendered because of people who were determined to stand out. And so are you and I called to stand out. We're called to stand out in terms of our compassion toward those who are lost and hurting. We're called to stand out in terms of how we use the wealth that God entrusts to our care. We're called to stand out in terms of how we choose to use our limited and valuable time. We're called to stand out in terms of the value and the dignity that we attribute to others, other human beings who were made in God, it, God's image, other human beings like us for whom Jesus was willing to die. Like him, we are called to offer others something that stands out in contrast to the darkness around them. We're to be different. We're to be a light for him. Brian Inkster goes on to say, I can only hope that my own presence in any place is as incongruous as John's tree. The way a light is incongruous in the darkness, incongruous like a baby in a manger or a savior on a cross, placed out of place by God, 
and therefore inescapably rightly placed. Just like that little imprisoned tree in its corner, placed there by a prisoner's hand. Years ago, I heard a story about a shipwreck that took place on a particular stretch of treacherous coast. And as you might expect, an inquest was called to determine what had gone wrong and why the ship had ended up on the rocks. Many people were called to testify, included among them was the keeper of the nearby lighthouse. In anticipation of the hearings, lawyers went about prepping the various witnesses for the testimony they'd be asked to give. But one lawyer found that in spite of being advised to simply answer the questions honestly and straightforwardly, the lighthouse keeper continued to appear extremely nervous. Finally, his turn came to mount the stand. Questions were asked and answered, and eventually he was dismissed. And as he walked from the courtroom, he let out a huge sigh of relief. Later, the lawyer went looking for him and, and asked him why giving his testimony had been such a big deal and why, when it was over, he'd seemed so relieved. And the lighthouse keeper responded, I'm just glad that they didn't ask the wrong question. The wrong question, the lawyer asked. Didn't you tell the court that you were on duty at the time of the wreck? Yes replied the lighthouse keeper. A and didn't you tell them that you went down to the shore waving the lamp, warning the ship, the lawyer asked. Yes, the lighthouse keeper replied again. Well then, asked the lawyer, what else could they possibly have asked you? What else, what would have been the wrong question? The lighthouse keeper replied, they could have asked me, was the lamp lit? I think that in many ways, that's precisely the question that Brian Inkster was struggling with, that the church should be struggling with, and that you and I need to be struggling with as we consider this calling that Jesus has laid upon our lives. Is the lamp lit? Is the light shining? Is the darkness being confronted? Are the, the shadows being driven back? Is the gloom being dispelled? Do we stand out as being out of place amidst the norms of this world? Are we incongruous in the way of Jesus Christ? Are we brightening our little corner? Again, is the lamp really lit? Like Brian, I can only hope that my presence in some way provides a contrast to the darkness, that it brings color to the gloom of some people's lives. I can only hope that in some way the light of Jesus Christ shines through me so as to give others cause to stop and wonder and glorify God, because that's my calling. And that's your calling too. Not just in the depths of January or in the midst of a pandemic, but every single day. For his sake, for their sake. Amen. Let's pray once more. Heavenly Father, in Jesus, you call us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And once again this morning, we acknowledge that our lives have often been more bland than salty and more shadow than light. Rather than standing out, we've tended to simply blend in. Rather than being out of place within the world, we've simply become a part of it. We thank you uh, for the reminder today that Jesus himself was one who seemed out of place. Remind us when we too are called upon to be different, that we are not alone. 
that we're simply following in the footsteps of the master. And Father, help us to be an encouragement to each other, cheering each other on. There are so many places in which the light of Jesus needs to shine today in our judicial system, our political system. There are so many issues in our society where your voice is simply unacknowledged and unheard. And Father, we think of the lives where there is no one and nothing to stand out in contrast to the darkness. No light, no hope, no promise of something better, no reason to go on. And Lord, it's in those situations where we know you need us to be and where you call us to go. Help us not to shy away from the challenges, but to commit ourselves with a fresh determination to be your light wherever you might need us to be. Lord, we pray for those in uh, our congregation who may need to see a glimpse of your light themselves today. And we pray that by our prayers, by our lives, by our very presence in the world, your light might continue to shine to the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.